Rogers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here in this wonderful place and to give a talk. So I will speak about uh, geometry and the equivalence problem of generic three-dimensional vector distributions. This is what the title says. But uh, I uh, realized when preparing this talk, I realized that there are too many technical details to cover them in one talk. So uh, rather than trying to produce a nice, uh, nicely formulated result with uh, a complete proof, I'll concentrate on some uh, critical technical details, which are actually um, uh, much more important than the result itself. So, uh, let's see. Yeah. so this is a complete, uh, uh, this is what I would, I would like to cover in this talk, but probably I'll roughly, uh, I'll just roughly finish the last uh, item. Uh, and we'll mostly speak about the second uh, thing here, which is called linearization of pseudo product structures. And, uh, well, let's go further. Uh, as I said, we speak about equivalence of vector distributions. Just a brief definition, what is a vector distribution? Um, well, classical people would call it Parfian system. So this is just a collection of independent one forms on Rn or any uh, n-dimensional manifold. And uh, we're interested in, uh, uh, essentially we're interested in zeros of these one forms and uh, common zeros uh, span what we call today uh, just sub-bundle or tangent bundle on a smooth manifold. Um, uh, well, the first thing uh, the first natural invariance for any vector distribution on a tangent space is the behavior of uh, uh, vector fields in this distribution with respect to the Lie bracket. So what happens if you take two vector fields in a vector distribution and start taking commutators? So you end up with the notion of a derived series. So you assume that the zero term is derived series is just zero. First term is the distribution itself, and then you start taking iterative Lie bracket, where each next time you take a bracket with only vector fields inside D. So it's sometimes called weak derived series. Um, uh, and of course, you remember what you got up to now. So you add uh, what you what you previously obtained. Uh, so this will be uh, one of the crucial uh, notions I'll constantly use, and it also provides us basic numeric invariance, namely the dimensions of these spaces, uh, natural, uh, first natural invariance of the distributions. Uh, and of course, we immediately rule out the trivial case, and the trivial case for me is uh, completely integrable distributions. This is a case uh, where Fabian's theorem can be applied when the Lie bracket of two vector fields sits inside the same distribution. And uh, uh, on the contrary, I would be interested in what's called bracket generating vector distributions. This is a case when uh, the, the, the uh, repetitive uh, uh, commutators generate all tangent space. Or, in other words, the distribution doesn't have any first integrals for those who like classical notation. Um, well, this is a, well, any generic distribution would have this type. I would, in general, not assume any additional things about uh, like symbols uh, of the distribution, symbols of voltation related to a distribution that appeared in uh, the talk of Professor Morimoto. Uh, and in general, the, the old, talk, old talk is strongly motivated by Tanaka theory of, of filtered manifolds. I will try to avoid this in this particular talk. I'm a great fan of this theory, but I'll show in this uh, talk what you can do uh, well, without mentioning this theory, even though you're really motivated by this theory. Uh, well, so uh, in short, what we do, we treat local equivalence theory of bracket generating vector distributions. Well, usually I will assume real uh, smooth category, though most of the results would also work in, in complex analytic category. 
and we avoid singularities. So we, uh, we consider local uh, equivalent theory at, at points where uh, all uh, 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 elements of the right series have constant rank and there are no singular things. Um, well, why it's three-dimensional distributions? Well, of course, one-dimensional distributions is very simple. This is where they're always integrable, so uh, they're all the same locally at a regular point. Well, equivalence of two-dimensional distributions is already uh, reach subject, as we all know from Cartan paper on um, uh, two-dimensional distributions um, uh, on five-dimensional manifold. Uh, but uh, uh, we did quite uh, well. We, uh, I and my collaborator uh, Igor Zelenka, managed to produce certain canonical frame associated with any two-dimensional vector distribution. So we consider this as a well, solved problem. Uh, so we move further to three-dimensional distributions. And uh, uh, why not any dimension? So at the moment, it looks extremely hard. We really thought that coming from two to three would, would, would be just straightforward. But uh, we observed so many new phenomena that up to now, I'm very skeptical about generalizations to high, higher dimensions. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what I, I, I prefer to discuss after the lecture. It's a technical point, and it would lead me too far. It's a technical assumption. And we'll just, I'm just say, I'll just say that up to now, we don't have any other example which does not satisfy this additional technical assumption. Uh, well, uh, the crucial notion, uh, uh, the crucial technical point in the study of uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional distributions uh, is a, a pseudo-product structure. In fact, this is more or less what was already introduced yesterday in, in the talk of uh, Pavel Narovsky. So I uh, use more uh, standard definition due to Tanaka. So pseudo-product structure is a pair of two completely integrable distributions, complementary such that their sum is bracket generating. So uh, the only difference uh, comparing to yesterday definition of Pavel Narovsky is that I, I do assume from the very beginning that the sum is bracket generating. Maybe this is uh, not, uh, maybe we can do a lot of things without this assumption, but again, I don't know any interesting example where this condition is not satisfied. Uh, well, the definition itself uh, was uh, introduced, as far as I know, by uh, Tanaka. And uh, he was also strongly motivated by uh, the study of the geometry of differential equations. So to me, to me well, and well, I, I'm pretty sure this is how Tanaka um, understood this. This is a right geometric uh, definition for a finite type system of ordinary of differential equations. Fine, by finite type system of differential equations, ordinary partial, um, uh, I understand the system which has only a finite dimensional space of solutions. So essentially, it looks like ordinary differential equations in the end. Uh, well, uh, and of course, uh, this is the example we've seen yesterday uh, in, in, in the stock file that Orsky just repeated. Uh, in the simplest, uh, in one of the simplest cases, we can treat any ordinary differential equation as a pseudo-product structure in the following way. We immediately introduce jet coordinates y0, y1, etc., yn, uh, and uh, then uh, geometrically, this differential equation can be viewed as a pair of one-dimensional distributions. So one of them defines as uh, the directions tangent to the lifts of solutions uh, on to the jet space. So essentially, this is our equation. Uh, and the second one uh, uh, is a direction tangent to the projection to the uh, jet of lower order. So essentially, we study a quantum geometry of ordinary differential equations. Again, this is a difference between my definition and Pavel Norovsky. So he's um, interested in point geometry, while this definition uh, is quantum invariant. 
And of course, if you, uh, so these are two one-dimensional distributions. Of course, both of them are integrable. If you make a sum of them, you get something which does not depend anymore on the equation. So equation enters as this, this, this uh, function f here in one of the coefficients. Uh, but if you add d by dyn, you end up with something which does not depend on the equation. And this is what's called con con contact system on the jet bundle. And, uh, well, it's easy to check that this is a bracket generating. So you would need to take n minus two brackets to generate, or n minus one bracket to generate all, all tangent space to the jet space. Uh, well, this picture, this example, generalizes more or less in the same way to systems of ordinary differential equations and, in general, to all determined systems of PDEs, as I told. So as soon as you have a, a finite type system of partial differential equations. Oh, right. I'm sorry. So I used letter f uh, the here, which denotes a function in the right-hand side. And here I used it to denote the distribution. I'm sorry. I think uh, we all understand that only this f means this function. <laughs> yeah, excuse me. Uh, so, uh, so as soon as you have a finite type system of differential equations, most likely they'll be able to write it as a pair of uh, completely integrable distributions, as a purely product structure. Okay, so next step is uh, to linearize pseudo projects, product structures. This is a key technical tool in all our constructions. Uh, what is a linearization? So nearly, uh, well, before, before I start speaking about linearizations, I would like to, to, to ask what is a linear equation? That uh, might sound pretty strange why do I ask this, because we all know what is a linear partial differential equation. Uh, but uh, it will be very important for me to understand uh, what I, uh, uh, to understand the duality between uh, linear partial linear uh, differential equations of finite type and submanifolds and Grassmann varieties. This is what Professor Marimoto uh, spoke uh, uh, about in the second half of his talk. So uh, I will. Um, I'll repeat the things. So, uh, probably I'll need Blackboard to give more details here. Uh, so probably it was uh, Wolchinsky who first noticed that these two categories are actually equivalent. So on one side, we have a systems of homogeneous linear ODEs or PDEs of finite type. Uh, on the other hand, we have submanifolds and Grassmann varieties. So these objects, from the first point of view, do, do, don't look like they're the same. But in fact, they are. And uh, 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 yeah, probably before going to the examples, I'll give uh, a brief um, uh, discussion of how, how at least one direction, uh, how this correspondence does work in one direction. So suppose you have a certain uh, manifold M with a, five, with a vector, vector bundle over it. So our solutions will be sections of vector bundles. And then we write uh, a linear system, which is generically, uh, or geometrically, would be jet, uh, something sitting inside the jet bundle. So, so this is a vector bundle of all jets, of sections of this vector bundle. And uh, so these are our jets, and we pick up some uh, vector sub-bundle, since we deal only with the equation. So this is coordinate free notation. Those who don't like it, just imagine a linear, uh, as you imagine it usually. Just linear combination of derivatives. And I would always assume that it is homogeneous. So we don't have any free term in our equations. And we all know that the solution space for such system is a vector space. Since we assume that it is a finite type, it is, it is a finite dimensional vector space. So solutions of uh, E is a, is a vector space, and uh, the dimension of this vector space is finite. Uh, this is already the vector space that will appear in the corresponding Gaussian variety. So what do we do? Uh, 
Uh, now we invite M into something which looks as a Grassmann variety. I'll put the dimension and the space later on. And we will do this as follows. For each point x in M, we just look at the solution to vanish at that point. So it's very easy and very natural. So we look at all solutions. Uh, we, we have the vectors in subspace here, which are all solutions in our vector space, in our solution space, which vanish uh, at this point. Uh, well, if we assume that this projection from equation 3 is uh, on 2, so uh, essentially this means that we can pick up initial conditions independently. Uh, so each e initial condition, there is a solution, at least one. Uh, initial condition of zero order. Uh, then this space will have the same co-dimension as the dimension of this vector space. So the dimension of this vector space is a number of dependent functions. You fix values of dependent functions uh, uh, at a point, and this means you, you uh, get something which has the same co-dimension as the dimension of this space. So co-dimension of Vx is the same as the dimension of uh, E, say, the point x. So uh, this works as follows. To each point x, we correspond to this dual space to Vx, which is, of course, in V star. So this is what happens. Here will be some letter L, where L is exactly this dimension of our vector bundle or the number of dependent functions. So this is a number of, number of dependent variables. variables. And the space here will be restore dual to the solution space. Doesn't look very simple. Though it's actually very natural. We just look at solutions which vanish at a point. We get the subspace. If you make it do it's dual mostly because uh, it, well, it's better to, to have a small dimensional vector space instead of small co-dimensional vector space. How does it work in practice? In practice, it works surprisingly easy. So you have a basis in your solution space. Fix a basis. Uh, uh, for simplicity, suppose you just have one. Suppose uh, L is equal to 1. So you have just one dependent variable. You have a linear system or one, one function of any number of variables. This is to simplify Grassmann varieties, because we would like to prefer to work in projective space. Of course, in this case, L will become just uh, projective space of some dimension, dimension b minus 1. Then, uh, so if we have uh, a system on just one function, and it is a linear system, its solution space is finite dimensional, pick up a basis, any basis. Let it be u0, u1, etc., u, k, where k is a dimension of, uh, I'll let it be u1 just to make sure you keep that. K is a dimension of V, of course, we pick up K functions, which are basis of solution space, and treat them as homogeneous coordinates of something in the projective space. So what we get for any point M, for any point uh, on M, we have a point in their projective space. Just a simple exercise to check that what I wrote here computationally is exactly the same what's given here abstractly. So this is, in fact, we can always invert this procedure, which I will not do here. Uh, just a simple exercise that if you have some embedding into projective space, you can always interpret it as a solution space for some system of finite type partial differential equations. Okay, so I'll switch off the light and return to, to transparency. Uh, well, just examples. And the examples are, of course, 
classical, so take the uh, simplest possible order differential equation, 1 plus 1 prime equal to 0, it's a linear system, solutions are well known, just one, uh, basis would be 1 x x squared, etc. x to the power n, form, uh, form uh, write them as coordinates, homogeneous coordinates of a certain curve, you got exactly what's called rational linear curve. So start from, so, so start from trivial equation, get the simplest possible non-degenerate curve in the projective space, rational normal curve. Uh, more generally, if you take any linear ODE, you get any non-degenerate curve in the projective space. So this correspondence gives us the correspondence between linear ODEs, linear homogeneous ODEs, and curves in the projective space. And this was a discovery of Wolczynski, and it is described in his beautiful book, uh, well, Projective Differential Geometry of Curves and Real Surfaces from 1905. So, uh, uh, so to me, today, a linear equation will be one of these things, and I will usually identify them. So to me, I will not make any difference between uh, explicit form of linear PDEs or the corresponding submanifold in Grassmann variety. So it's just the same. Uh, second example which I would be interested in uh, is the following now, uh, system of uh, two PDEs of finite type. So Z is now a function of X and Y and write the following, system, so the following equation, zx x equal to zyy y equal to zero. I didn't write here the solution space. It's a simple exercise to see that the solution space is actually four-dimensional and consists of, well, it's generated by putting, by functions one, the constant, x, y, and x, y. It's easy to see that all these functions do satisfy this equation, and in fact, this is all solution space. So we would need to differentiate this uh, one more time to get a closed type system. The other item is, a, as I told before, is homogeneous coordinates, and you get a quadric, quadric in P3. So to the simplest possible system of that type, or oh, well, one of the simplest possible, you get a quadric in P3, more generally, and this is also um, the discovery of Wolczynski as far as the oh, maybe there are as well. Uh, you can study surfaces in P3 by studying this type of systems of linear differential equations. Of course, here you would need to assume that they, are, they satisfy integrability conditions. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between systems of this type which satisfy compatibility conditions and surfaces in P3. And in fact, this is how Wolczynski constructed, uh, well, he had a number of works on the geometry of surfaces in P3, and he constructed a number of invariants studying this system of equations. Okay, uh, so what is a linearization? We now understand what is a linear equation. So what is a linearization? So linearly, of course, we know how to linearize. We have an OE, we just write something, uh, some linear system. Well, we fix, of course, the solution because we always linearize along the solution. So essentially, we deform uh, a solution and look uh, under which conditions on the deformation, first order deformation, uh, our initial equation is satisfied. So if Z is that first order deformation, so Y is equal Y0 plus epsilon to Z, then Z should satisfy this linear system well, so we take here partial derivatives of f with respect to y, y prime, etc., y to the power n, and evaluate them on our solution. This is how uh, computationally linearization is done. Um, uh, I will try to do the same for pseudo product structures. So we all know that the well, finite type system is just a pseudo product structure. How can we linearize, linearize any pseudo product search? Well, it's a bit more tricky. So remember we have uh, two completely integrable distributions, E and F, a pair of, pseudo, uh, pair of completely integrable distributions. So what we do, we can see that we assume for a while that our um, all integral manifolds of E form a nice smooth manifold, so we can quotient by E, or locally, 
uh, we can always assume this. And denote by this curved E, choreographic E, the space of all integral manifolds. So quotient manifold, essentially, by the completely integrable distribution. Uh, now, look what happens with the second distribution if we uh, project along one particular integral manifold of E. So we have two distributions. We have a projection that move, maps each integral manifold of the first one to a point. And now we would like to see what happens with the second one if you do this projection. So we fix a point in our solution space, which is just integral or submanifold, a curve. That's not necessarily a curve, of course. It's a mistake here. So we have a projection. Our tangent space is projected to the space tangent to the space of all integral uh, element, integral uh, manifolds. So here we have this projection only defined for, uh, well, it's defined everywhere, but we look at it only along one particular integral curve. And look what happens with the second distribution. So as we project, the second distribution defines us as a manifold in the Grassmann variety. So it shows us, this submanifold essentially shows us how second distribution moves along the integral curves of the first one. So this is what happens. Pretty natural, well, well so in, in letters probably, in, in, in strict mathematical notation it might look uh, a bit tricky, but uh, this is what happens. We project an integral curve and look at what happens with the second distribution along this projection. What we get, we get a, uh, so our integral manifold is, becomes, uh, we get an embedding, or, or just map, of our integral manifold gamma to a Grassmann variety of all subspaces of dimension L to the tangent space where L is the dimension of the second distribution. Well, difficult, difficult to, <laughs> to grasp that this is actually the same what's written here, but just if you do the exercise and try to uh, do the same, this procedure for the pseudo product structure corresponding to this equation, you will see that this is actually the same. What you get, you get linearization. In other words, uh, in other words, what happens, uh, you try to study your distribution F by taking derivatives only in the direction of directions of E. So you study the second distribution, taking derivatives along the first one, or vice versa, depends on what you, which of these you would like to, to linearize. In fact, here we have also two distributions. We would, one of, linearization along one of them gives us a standard linearization. The second one is just trivial, nothing happens, it stops so you, you, it, it, it leads us to a very degenerate map, which doesn't provide us any information, which is not surprising. But in general, those linearizations are interesting. What would you say curly E? Curly, curly E is a space of all integral submanifolds of E. So uh, in, if, you, if you speak about differential equations, this would be the space of solutions. So it's also a finite Yes. Because, well, uh, here we are in the framework of finite dimensional smooth manifold, in the framework of pseudo product structure. Of course, if you have a, a completely integrable distribution on a smooth finite dimensional manifold, the space of all integral submanifolds uh, will be finite dimensional and will, will have the same dimension as core dimension of a distribution we speak about. Any integral submanifold? Dimension is not fixed. Oh, mm, well, uh, yeah, maximal integral. So of course, of course, we, we speak about maximal integral manifolds. Otherwise, we would we would lose information. Maximal integral manifolds. Thank you. Boris, is there a general realization of pseudo product structures as some class of differential equations like Powell was talking about yesterday? Well, he he said well he introduced already the coordinate system. So you may, may try this coordinate system and understand uh, it. Uh, in, in this coordinate system, so the product structure would lead us to some huge system of first order PDEs of finite type. First order PDEs. Yeah, but then it's, uh, 
uh, it's up to a good luck to recognize that actually this is a prolongation of some n order system, if it is right. uh, an n-sorder system. Like here, uh, if you write this in coordinates of parallel, you get a system you would get if you assume that y, y prime, etc., y n are independent. They uh, are dependent, uh, different fun new functions, new functions. So if you wrote your pseudo product structure as a system yeah. of first order yeah. total differential equation, yeah. then you could do a formal linearization on that. Yes, and, and this will be exactly the same. That's this will be absolutely the same. Okay. So any any way to, mm, to define linearization in a natural kind will lead you to the same definition. So, well, I, I don't know whether my way was was uh, the most naive and simple, but that's how I see it. Well, uh, what to do with the linearization? Suppose we know, well, now we know linear equations, we know how to linearize, what to do with this linearization, how far, what do we lose if we go from a pair of completely integrable distribution to some curves in Grassmann varieties? So, of course, since our construction was natural, any equivalence map of two pseudo-product structures would map us linearizations to linearizations. So in particular, invariance, differential invariance of linearizations, by differential invariance I mean differential invariance of submanifolds in Grassmann variety. So it's already kind of a linear problem. Well, we like curves and projective space, differential invariance of curves and projective space or more generally, if you speak about differential invariance of surfaces, I mean by them like second fundamental form, which is defined up to multiplication and projective space, and so on. So this is a kind of differential invariance we get. And all this differential invariance will immediately become invariance of the original pair of distribution. So if you are lucky and we know how to construct moving frame, by moving frame I just mean the moving frame all of submanifolds and homogeneous space, because Grassmann variety is just a homogeneous space. Um, for, some, for some particular cases, uh, classics managed to, uh, to, to give us uh, nice moving frames, like we have a moving frame for a curve and projective space, though it's not really very simple to construct. We have kind of a moving frame for hypersurfaces and projective space. Um, as far as I know, this completes the list. Uh, there are some uh, curves uh, for in Grassmann, some theories of moving frames for Grassmann varieties, but this is much trickier, much much more complicated. And I tried to find any results on moving frames for two-dimensional submanifolds in projective space, and I failed. This is any moving frame theory for two-dimensional submanifolds in projective space of any dimension. No results. That's not really surprising because uh, in, in projective, uh, there is a one nice curve you can, you can use for approximating other curves. This is a rational normal curve. But for surfaces, uh, there is no such obvious choice. You have the like, rational normal scores, you have uh, embeddings of uh, uh, segre, and so it's like you don't know how to approximate other surfaces. By, by, but anyway, if you do have a moving frame, and sometimes we need to work hard to find this moving frame, we can always try to lift it up to a certain bundle over our original manifold. And this does work perfectly well in cases where uh, we, uh, can, uh, build, we have such moving frame. Uh, finally, that's one of the uh, applications how to construct geometric structures on solution spaces of Find it on solution spaces of differential equations. Suppose all linearizations, by linearization here, I mean submanifold in Grassmann variety, or in projective space, suppose they appear to have the same type. They're all equivalent uh, from the point of view of, homogy of, of Grassmann variety. For example, they're all rational curves, or they're all quadrics in P3. Then, this means that we have uh, in, each tangent, in each tangent space to the space of our integral mani manifolds in the to, to the solution space, in each tangent space we have a fixed nice submanifold. 
or a column usually, and this is how geometric structures are defined. So you can this way get uh, conformal structures, uh, SL2 structures, uh, and well, actually pretty many structures which can be defined by a cone of uh, distinguished directions in the tangent space. You just have to assume that all your linearizations will be exactly this cone. So this is the way how to produce nice geometric structures on the space of integral manifolds. Okay, so now I, I'm going to, to the first example of six-dimensional manifold finally, or six, uh, sorry, uh, of three-dimensional vector distribution. And my examples uh, will be uh, mostly moon, apart from the last one, uh, which is uh, difficult and probably I won't be able to reach it. So first two examples are actually uh, known in, well, appear in the literature probably in a different context. So first one is what I call three, five, six distributions on, six, on M6. This means that we have a three-dimensional vector distribution on a six-dimensional smooth manifold, and we assume that its the right flag has the following dimension, five and then six. So if you first take brackets of D with itself, you get something five-dimensional. And then you take one more bracket, you generate all tangent space. So this is the assumption. Well, then we can do, I, I like this notation, we can compute the square root of D. <laughs> we all know how to uh, compute integral powers of D, but not, not rational ones. But here, luckily, just in this case, and well, in some very exceptional other cases, you can define the square root of D. So if you look at the integral elements of D, it appears that uh, in each, at each point you have exactly one two-dimensional integral manifold, integral element. So there is exactly one two-dimensional plane inside each D, D is three-dimensional, which satisfies this condition. If you take a bracket of square root of D with itself, it lies in D, which is, which is a definition of an integral element. So, uh, this is uh, the reason why we call it square root of D, because it's square lies in D. <laughs> square root of D is... So it's, uh, again, I don't, uh, uh, I don't go into technical details, but it is a trivial linear algebra. If you look at it yourself, you'll immediately see that it's true. So you, you, we, we have one candidate. We have, we have a two-dimensional sub-bundle inside D. Then we build up another one-dimensional sub-bundle, which is complementary to the first one, and it can be constructed as a Cauchy characteristic of D square. So D square is five-dimensional on six-dimensional manifold. We have a co-dimension one distribution, and it is in, in, on the manifold of uh, even dimension. So we have to have one, at least one Cauchy characteristic direction. It appears that it's uh, under, under pretty mild again, genericity conditions, there is exactly one dimensional Cauchy characteristic direction. And E plus F are complementary and form D together. Of course. Yeah? Is, is the bracket of square root of D and D, does that, does that give you um, D squared? Or does square, it, yeah, it yeah of course. <laughs> <laughs> the bracket of square root of D and D will give you D square because there's only one direction left outside of square root of D. <coughs> if you commute it with square root of D, you should get two complementary directions by assumption that D squared is five. Simply don't have any other brackets to use. Now, there are still two cases to consider. Uh, it might appear, even though these uh, square root of D is two-dimensional, it might not be completely integrable, which breaks our definition of a pseudo-product structure. But then, if square root of D is not completely integrable, this means that uh, square root of D of squared is exactly D. If it were completely integrable, then square root of D squared would be just square root of D. It would be something two-dimensional. But here, if square root of D is not completely integrable, then it's D itself, and then to study the geometry of D is the same as to study the geometry of square root of D. So we then reduce the problem of three-dimensional distribution to the problem of Kuhlin's problem for two-dimensional distributions. 
So we, we managed then to recognize our D as a square of some smaller two-dimensional distribution. And then we can see that our, uh, our problem is done because I don't deal with two-dimensional distributions today. <laughs> so I gave a reference, and actually you, you, you do apply all the techniques in this paper, and you get the complete equivalence problem solved for this type of distributions. So the only interesting case left is when the square root of D is completely integrable, and then E and F are just purely product structure, naturally associated with D. Now we apply linearization. So we try to, to linearize everything. I shortly, shortly, I very briefly describe what happens here, because again, it becomes too technical to, 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 to manage in one talk. So if square root of D completely integrable, we have two linearizations. We can linearize, linearize along E, which is square root of D, I'm sorry. So E is square root of D. What we get, we get surfaces in P3. That's a simple dimension count. So linearization along E provides us a family of surfaces in P3. So luckily the geometry of surfaces is well known. We can construct a moving frame invariance and actually use this moving frame to build up uh, some nice uh, 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 canonical bundle over M and uh, an absolute parallelism on it, actually a Cartan connection. We can go other way around. We can, uh, we can, we can uh, linearize along F. Then what we get is curves in Grassmann variety of two-dimensional subspaces in R4. Again, we are lucky because this was done by Wilczynski himself. Uh, uh, Invariants are known. Uh, and again, the frame is known, and we can use it to build yet another Cartan connection. So if you normalize them properly, and we know uh, from Tanaka that we have to use some normality conditions to normalize Cartan connections, these two connections will coincide. But on our way, we actually computed a number of invariants. Invariants of both linearizations become invariants of our initial problem. And uh, then we can recall that uh, we have a wonderful Tanaka theory, uh, which leads us to a par parabolic geometry. And uh, in this case, this parabolic geometry uh, would be of this very easy type. Well, I, I don't go into the details. I just write this for those who knows what these diagrams mean. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, and then apply some computation, cost and theorem, in the form of Schulhan software package, and see that actually what all the, these are exactly all harmonic invariants. Oops. These are all harmonic invariants, all, all fundamental invariants we got. OK, so I move to the next slide. How it is all related to real partial differential equations, not just some distributions? So. I say that actually, if you would like to study this, this type of PEs, so this is again two equations of second order on one function of two variables, this is exactly as studying three, five, six distributions. It's just one to one. How does it work? So these two equations give us something six dimensional in this jet space second jet space of uh, maps from R2 to R. So we have one function of two variables and take two derivatives. All together, all jet coordinates will give us eight dimensions, eight coordinates. It's x, y, z, zx, zy, and all th in three second order derivatives. We, got, we have two conditions on them. It means we have something six dimensional. And uh, then we just uh, take a standard coordinate system in a jet space, restricted on M6, and what we get is exactly a distribution of type 3, 5, 6. So what we did on the previous slide, we actually solved the equivalence problem for these distributions. And on our way, gave a nice geometric um, interpretation for all, all fundamental invariants for this type of system. Uh, um, more details here. So first of all, uh, compatibility conditions for this system mean exactly that square root is completely integrable. Then, uh, if you linearize along this square root, and we recall that we get surfaces in P3, this corresponds just to naive 
standard linearization of the thing. So if we naively linearize this, we get a system of two linear equations on one function of two variables. And this is exactly, uh, and this is exactly uh, the type of systems defining as surfaces in P3. Uh, well, so suppose now all invariants of this linearization vanish. And as usual, if all invariants vanish, this means we've got the simplest possible non-degenerate surface. And the simplest possible non-degenerate surface in P3 is quadric. So it's not surprising, and we actually checked already that trivial equation describes as quadric in P3. So if this linearization along E um, has trivial invariance uh, at each point, then all surfaces are quadrics and we get quadrics in the tangent space, uh, corner work quadric, or quadric in the projectivization, uh, in other words, um, at each tangent space uh, to the solution space of the system. So this is how conformal to two structures and under mild modification of this symbol, one three structures were constructed in, in the works of uh, Kozamech and Neumann. I'm sorry, I didn't write it here, these names. Uh, to finish, well, there's two, two comments to finish my talk. So first of all, if we linearize along another direction, F, which is not written here, I just realized when preparing the slides. And if we assume that this linearization is trivial, we also do get a nice uh, geometry in the solution space. This will be a Legendrian geometry on five-dimensional contact manifold. Uh, so this corresponds to so-called correspondence spaces. So this would give us conformal geometry and this would give us uh, Legendrian geometry. So this linearization, linearization principle really helps us to understand also uh, uh, when it is possible to use this kind of diagrams. People from differential geometry invent and use a lot. From parabolic uh, geometry, sorry. And, uh, that's first thing. Second, and uh, we can use similar approach based on pseudo product structures and its linearis and their linearizations to completely solve the equivalence problem for some generic class of C, Thix, and distributions. So I, I move forward a bit, uh, but uh, the three six distributions I won't even discuss here. Anyway, it's Brian's uh, work, so. Nothing new. So for 3, 6, and distributions, uh, uh, 3, 6, and means that D is an arbitrary three-dimensional distribution uh, with the square of dimension 6. And the, the dimension n here is the dimension of manifold, and it can be arbitrary. Under some trick, and for this trick, I, I suggest you, you go to a hive and look for our joint paper with Igor Zelenka on three-dimensional vector distributions, you find out that the pattern is absolutely the same. We use some trick to lift everything to the cotangent bundle. We build up projective pseudo product structure out of it. We linearize, look for the invariance of the linearization, and construct a canonical frame. So this is how uh, the equivalence problem of arbitrary C6 and distributions can be solved in a pretty effective way. Okay, I stop here.